On what occasion do you anoint with oil? If someone asks me, and if they bring the oil. <laughs> okay? Because I don't have any with me. So, there you go. It is scriptural. Um, <clears throat> I would be considered an elder in the body of Christ, which has nothing to do with age. All right? Just let you know. Okay? <laughs> but it, um, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you ask me to do it, I'll do it, but please bring the oil. Okay? And if you bring the oil, it's your oil, so if it gets in your hair and gets on your clothes, you can't sue me for it, it's your oil. Okay? So, <clears throat> believe it or not, people will try to get you to pay their cleaning bill because you spilled oil on them. Right? So, um, it's kind of ridiculous, but still, it's what happens. Okay. Uh, it says, I know you don't need a prayer for, uh, formula for prayer, but I think it'd be good for us to hear you pray for people to build our confidence on how simple it is. That's very true. <clears throat> Essentially, there are some, while there's not a formula, there are things that as you do it, you will find yourself doing things certain ways. And really, it's very simple. What it comes down to, and, and I'll give you specifics. I mean, we will do this, and tonight, especially when we start to minister, I will take you through several different ways to pray for people, and you will know what to do, all right? So we will be specific. Now, just don't take that for a formula and think you have to mimic word for word every time that, all right? But essentially, it comes down to this. <clears throat> Tell the Spirit the sickness, or the body, what you want it to do. That's it, right? You can, if it's a spirit, if it's caught, you say, okay, now how do you tell if it's a spirit, or how do you tell if it's a sickness, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Usually, and, and, and again, what I, try, what I have found is that when you try to get too specific, if you miss it, the enemy will not listen to you at all. So, generally, Unless God specifically points something out to you, I don't get specific. I get, I'm very general. Uh, and I will speak to this thing. And I have learned, used to, I would speak specifically and call this thing out and call that thing out. And from time to time, I still do. But generally, I try to just minister life. And so, well, usually, I just tell people, be healed. That's it. See, what you expect is what will happen. And Sometimes one problem isn't the problem. That's the symptom of another problem. And if you hit one thing, you're not hitting the real cause of it. And if you hit that, that can disappear and let the person still die from something else. So it's just much easier just to say, be healed. And that means head to toe, total, complete. There you go. So, and, and understand, it's not about, let me say it this way. The more specific you have to be to get results, the less power you're operating in. Right? I mean, think about it. Snipers are amazing people, but they have to be dead on accurate. Okay? A person with their finger on a nuclear warhead doesn't have to be near as accurate. Okay? <laughs> kind of get it in the general vicinity, takes care of the whole problem. Right? We want Jesus operated from a nuclear perspective. Okay? That's what we want to do. Our God is bigger than any single individual problem. And sometimes one problem, people come to me all the time and tell me one thing, and yet they got five things wrong. And for some reason they think, well, but this is a serious thing, and the others I can live with. I know that doesn't seem to make much sense, but this is the way people do. And so we just hit the whole thing. Amen? Yeah, yeah so just get general. Um, okay, we'll talk about that here in a minute probably. Yep. Uh, yes. <clears throat> is it possible to pray for a person through a representative for them and see results, such as like a parent for a child? Yes. Yeah, the primary example is uh, Matthew chapter 8 with the Roman centurion uh, praying he came and had faith for his servant. And so, yes, remember, there is no such thing as distance in the spirit. Okay, distance means nothing in the... Let me put it this way. First off, let me s kill a sacred cow. <clears throat> People say, well, faith works by love. No, it doesn't. It, the Bible does not say that. When it says the part that people quote there, it talk, Paul is talking and he says that the faith which gets, which I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, the faith which gives you or gets you credit for doing something is faith that comes from love. Now, Paul said, if I have faith to move mountains and have not love, it profits me nothing. So he didn't say if I have if I don't have love, I can't have faith to move mountains. You can have faith to move mountains and not have love, and it won't profit you anything. Now, it may profit whoever you're helping, but you don't get credit for it, right? So you don't want to operate there, but you can, right? I'm not telling you to, okay? You should love people. 
But I'm just saying, we have this idea, because if I ask you, do you love people? Most people say, well, I try to. But, I, you know, I don't love people like I should. And then because of that, you've been taught that faith works by love, so you think your faith won't work because you don't love people enough. Now, your faith will love, your faith will work even if you don't like people. All right? But you don't want to be there. Okay? Okay, let me put it this way. Why do you think it's so hard to get your, your family healed? <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, the answer is not what you think. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, because <clears throat> the mention, the other question here was, uh, what about laying, uh, the value of laying hands on yourself for healing? Okay? You can do that because it is a point of contact. You can do that. But Romans 8 says that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He will quicken your mortal body. So it's not a matter of coming out of your hand in that case as much as it is coming out of your spirit. Right? All you're doing, because see, your spirit's in your hand. You know, it tra it's all through. So where we put your hand, your spirit is there also. So that's why you put your hand is so life can flow through your spirit. So the same life that would flow out of your spirit through your hand into a person and heal them will also heal, flow into your body and heal you. I did a, actually the last time I was here, not when well I'm here, but here in Melbourne uh, and, and, and wherever we were at, I not remember where we were at, but I taught on how to release the spirit out of your flesh or through your flesh, into your flesh. And it was the first time I'd ever taught it publicly like that but basically it just says everything you need is in the spirit and all you have to do is learn how to let the life the spirit of life out of your spirit into your flesh and you can walk in divine health so essentially that's what it comes down to so you don't have to put your hand on you see because your spirit is everywhere in you I mean really all you'd have to do is stop and think there's a problem there and say okay and then let life flow out of the spirit of you your God's spirit in you flowing out into that if it's in your shoulder into that area you don't have to touch it it would come out of your spirit into that area you understand so okay um, now one of the reasons why you do have a hard time getting relatives healed is because and, and see this is what throws people off which is because you would think well I love them so my faith should be working for them. But the problem is it's a different kind of love. The love that works, that the Spirit works through, is not soulish love. See, you love your relatives through, out of your soul, not out of your spirit. Your spirit loves no one in particular. What I mean by that is your spirit doesn't love partially. Uh, it, it loves impartially. All right? It loves everybody the same. Your problem is not, see, in here you love everybody the same. Where you don't love everybody the same is here. Right? Why? Because here's how you know them. And so that blocks this kind of love. So you pick some people to like and some people you don't. And so the problem is when you love people out of your soul, you love your relatives and you love them a whole lot and you want to see them healed. But the problem is the reason you want to see them healed is because you love them. Well, that's not the basis for healing. The basis for healing is because it's not right that they be sick because Jesus bore it. See, soulish love doesn't heal. Spirit love heals. You understand that? You see what I'm saying? So when you love someone that's close to you, you try to love them out of the soul because you love them and you want them healed because you don't want to see them suffer. And you would say, well, that's love, so it should work. But no, it's soulish love. It's human love. Human love is not the love of God. Agape love is the love of God. Agape love loves everybody the same. So, when you can pray for your own... Now, now, this... I know this sounds weird. Okay, how many of you know that the Bible is full of paradoxes? Right? Okay, if you want to be exalted, what do you have to do? Humble yourself, right? If you want to live, you got to die. Isn't that right? I mean, it's just it, pretty much, like I told you, it's the opposite, right? The, the problem is the church has gone along natural lines, along human reasoning... So if we really want to be in line with the Spirit, then we pretty much have to do everything the opposite of the way the world does it, and automatically you're more like Spirit. Okay? Now, love, when you love somebody, if you love them out of your soul, then you won't get the effects because that's soulish and that's just human and there's no power there. The power is out of the Spirit. So whenever you, you have a loved one, see, you have to learn... <coughs> And if you go out and minister much, you'll, you'll, you'll experience this, right? So a lot of this is going to come by experience. There's things I can tell you, but you won't know it till you go out, and then when you go out and do it, you will experience it, right? Now, when you love someone, when you go to somebody's house or hospital, and you don't know them, then why are you going? 
Well, okay, you're commanded to, okay? Maybe you've been requested by them to come, but you're going because hopefully you understand, and if you don't, you will by the end of the day, that healing was in the atonement, it was provided for people, and it's not right for any person to bear what Jesus has already bore, right? So really the reason you're going is from a legal standpoint of the fact that this isn't legal. This thing does not have a legal right to be there because Jesus already bore it, right? So you're going into this situation, and you're not going in emotional, right? You're not going in there from an emotional standpoint. You don't get emotional usually till you get there and you see them. You're going based on truth and based on the fact that the fact that you're going proves you love impartially because you're going, and you may not think you love them, but the fact that you're going proves you're loving them because you're laying down your life, your time, your effort, and everything you could be doing to go to them, right? That's laying down your life for others, and that's the greatest love you can have. And the more you lay down your life for others, the greater the love is, right? So when you go to a hospital, you are loving impartially. Which is why when your faith works through that, you do get credit for that from God. Because you are loving impartially. You're not loving like a human, you're loving like God loves. Right? You get that? Now, the problem is, then when you pray for your child or your loved one, now it's different because now you get emotional. And you shift from here to here. And all of a sudden now you get all involved in it and you start pushing, God, we want this done and God, this has got to be done and God, why, why are they saying? And say all of a sudden you switch from this is the right, this, the, you know, it's not right that this person be sick. This is right that I go set them free and instead of a doing it from like a policeman on a legal basis, you're doing it totally emotional, you're getting involved in the situation and you move into sympathy rather than compassion. Right? So you have to learn and it's not as hard as you think, but you have to learn to love everybody the same, and which means you have to be able to pray for your neighbor's kids the same way you'd pray for your own. But, and I should even say that, maybe even opposite, to say you need to learn to pray for your own kids the way you would pray for your neighbor's. See, if you go and pray for your neighbor's kid the way you pray for your own, a lot of times you'd get emotional because you'd get emotional with your own kid. But if you don't get emotional for your neighbor's kid, then they'll get healed because you're doing what's right and you're operating out of faith and operating out of the Spirit. And then when you pray for your own kid, <clears throat> you don't want to get emotional. You want to do the same thing, bring that same attitude, that same stand, that same position over onto your own kid. And you're looking at them not... There have been times I've had to stop and say, I'm not here as your father. I'm here as a man of God. I, I had, even with my own parents, I did that one time because they were going through something. My, my dad was going through something. And I actually had to go to him and say, because I'm, I'm his son, so there is that natural order. But I had to go into him and, and basically say, you know, Dad, you know I love you and, you know, all that, but I'm not here as your son. I'm here as a man of God. I represent God. And then I went after this thing. And so it was a different thing. Do you understand? And he got healed. And so you have to learn what real love is. Real love is impartial. Right? And so... These are some things, that's why sometimes it's harder to get relatives healed than it is others. Why? Because you get emotional and you get out of the spirit and you get into the soul. Right? So just stay in the spirit. Now, the problem is when you stay in the spirit, people will accuse you of being non-emotional, non-loving, hard, uh, callous, all that stuff. And they'll say things like, well, we just don't sense love in you. And, that, and that, I've been through all that. I've heard all that stuff. But the fact is, I told them, I said, you know, it's funny you say that, but I didn't see you in the hospital room with me when I was praying for these people. You know, I see you sitting at home watching television, doing whatever you do, and y yet you think you have love for them and you think I don't, but I laid down my life for them and you don't. Right? I went through a thing with uh, <clears throat> a young man was married and wanted to travel with me, and he was a, he was a good young man. I mean, he was, had some great potential. And we went to eat with him one night talking about whether they should travel, with, whether he should travel with me or not. And his wife was looking at it strictly as a business type proposition because she's wanting to know, you know, how, what was his days off? When would he be home? How much money would he make? All that kind of stuff. And my wife and I were sitting there and he and his wife were there and, and she was saying, well, you know, family's important and uh, he needs to be home for Easter. He needs to be home for Christmas. You know, he needs to be the, which I, I said, you know, honestly, I'm not speaking on Easter and Christmas a lot. You know, there are other things that people plan. They don't call in healing seminars and things like that during that time. <clears throat> and I said, but, I said, the problem is not that. And I said, the thing is, um, and I, I kind of 
Well, first off, she started about the money, wanted to know how much money she makes, says, you know, because we, ha we have a budget. And he wasn't talking. You know, that was the first problem. And so <clears throat> she was doing all the talking for him. And f so finally, I, I told him, I said, I'm, I'm going to answer her question, then I'm not going to talk to her, I'm going to talk to you. I said, because you're going to be the one traveling with me, and I don't need to hear what she says, I need to hear what you say. And so and I, I got kind of snippy with him at one point. I, <clears throat> I, I actually told him, I said, if I want your mother's opinion, I'll ask her, so stay out of it. And so... Because I don't put up with that stuff, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I won't do it. See, because, you know why? If I was just preaching, then yeah, I would work with it. But I'm not just preaching, this is life or death. And if you don't get serious, people are going to die while you play games. And pretty much what I told her is, I said, you know, you want him to be, uh, well, what I told her was, I said, you want to be a, a minister's wife. You want a nice little house with a white picket fence. You want reputation. You want to be thought well of. You want to be able to go to the store, go to your hairdresser, and tell everybody your husband's a minister so everybody will look at you like you're something. And I said, the reality is this. I said, you want to, she wanted to play the piano for the church, which is no big deal. I mean, you know, it's yay or nay for me. I don't care. But I said, <clears throat> you want to do that? You want to put on your little Christmas cantata, which is fine. I said, but you want to make sure your husband's home on Christmas? You want it because what you want to do is you want to take a vacation from God every Christmas and every Easter because you want to put on your little plays and your little things that do nothing but tread water and, and buy time and while you're taking a vac vacation from God that cancer is still eating away somebody's life I said you want to take a week off and you want to go play you know Christmas and in the meantime people are still dying and I said so first off you're not even serious about God let alone about anything else and so you know, she's, well, 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 and started kind of backpedaling a little bit. And I said, no, no, don't even go there. And she said, well, no, and, and it's funny because my, my wife and I were sitting right next to each other. And my, my wife's hands were like this, and she's like, hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so finally, I, just, I told her, I said, would you stop it? I'm, stop. <laughs> and just, and I took my chair and I scooted it over. <laughs> so, but I moved over. And, and finally, she just kind of hit me. She's like, you know. <clears throat> and, and the girl sitting across the table, she started saying, no, no, because I was getting pretty upset over this thing. Because, and, and, you know, people don't know, you know, what goes on. Like last night when I went back to the hotel room, I got on, online real quick and started getting emails and started getting prayer requests, which most emails are that. And, you know, pictures of children, horrible things, you know, in their lives and different things. And this isn't preaching, you understand? I mean, I enjoy what I do. Don't misunderstand me. It's not a burden. I'm not always depressed. I, mean, I hope you can tell I'm not depressed. I, I enjoy life. I have a good time. But this is very serious. And so <clears throat> she was sitting there, and she started this, and this is what she shouldn't have done because <laughs> I was already not real excited about her anyway. <laughs> and so <clears throat> she started saying, no, Kurt, Kurt, I, I know how you feel. I know how you feel. And I'm like, wrong answer, you know? <laughs> I'm like, whoa, don't even say you know how I feel. I said, I don't see you in that hospital next to those people that are dying. I don't see you walking there and these people look at you like you got to do something or my loved one's going to die. I don't see you walking around. I don't see you up at 2 o'clock in the morning answering the phone calls. I said, what I hear from you is you want your husband here on this day and that day and you want to make sure you're going to make enough money to live good. And I said, you're, everything you're talking about is image. And I said, and you're going to end up, and I said, and if, and if he works with me, I'm going to be on the road, and you're going to be calling him all the time and saying, when are you coming home, and you're going to keep his mind divided, and he's going to be totally useless, and it's going to end up causing problems, and people are going to die, and it's going to be because you want him home so you can parade him around and say, this is my little husband on your leash. <clears throat> and I mean, she was, you know, she started backpedaling real quick, and my wife, and now I'm getting loud. I mean, I'm starting to get, and we're in a restaurant, you know. And pe people are starting to look and this kind of stuff. And my wife's like, curry, curry, curry. It's, it's okay. And I'm like, no, it ain't okay. And so, you know, and I, I said, maybe I ought to just give you my number. I said, or better yet, maybe I ought to just take your phone number and put it on my website. Let people call you every hour of the night. And I said, Let, let's see how you do it then. And I said, you get a hold of some of these situations. I said, this is not playtime. This isn't playing church. You want to play church? Plenty of them out there doing it. Have at it. This is life or death. And, and so she got real quiet. Well, I need to say he didn't work with me. So anyway. <laughs> so, but I, I'm telling you, I'm not, um, again, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think I'm easy to get along with, but, you know, <laughs> but seriously, I'm, I enjoy life. You know, I don't know how to explain it, but this is real. This isn't about 
playtime. This isn't about, it's not even about knowing something. It's about what you do with what you know. You understand? This isn't about just sitting and going to a seminar and, and, and saying, well, I've been to that seminar now. Why, oh, next week we've got a prophecy seminar coming. Let's run it. It's not, you want to do that? Fine. I, you know, that's you. I can't do that. I got people that call and I have to be able to get answers. I have to be able to touch lives and make sure they live because if they don't, they're going to die. And see, if you don't have a grave somewhere, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. But I've got a grave in McKinney, Texas, and I don't want ever anybody else to ever have a grave like I do. You understand? Now, we've, it's been 30 years now. <clears throat> a little over that, actually, I guess. But, um, yeah, about that. That, and, and I've not lost another child. We've came close, as I told you yesterday with my daughter. So we've had situations. There's things that go on. But, I've, I, you know, and I don't know everything. You know, I wish I did, but I don't. There's a lot of things that I don't know, but all I do know is I know a few things that work very well. You know, so, you know, I, I, there's stuff I don't care to know about. I, I'm blessed that I don't know a lot of the stuff, the garbage that goes out. I don't watch Christian television, to be honest with you. You know, I really don't. You know, matter of fact, when I do, you can usually tell it because the next day I am mean. <laughs> I mean, I mean mean. Because I get, just, I get just riled up watching that stuff, you know? And you know why? Because I hate to watch God's people just get raped. Literally, by, by charlatans and people that put on shows, and they're always coming up with the next gimmick to get put, somehow pull money out of you. You understand? Honestly, I mean, if you think about it, now understand, I go around the world, airplane tickets are not, not cheap, all right? They cost money. It really does. It costs money to go places. It costs money to have venues. It costs, you know, I mean, it's been great here because we're not getting charged for it. I mean, you know, not that I know of. Or if there is, I, I hadn't heard about it, so I don't know. But, but I'm telling you, but I do know there are places that, that charge. Like in Africa, um, for some reason over there, they charge for you to attend a seminar. And, you know, we don't do that. All the, I don't believe in charging for the gospel. People say, well, then why do you sell CDs and stuff? You said it right there. I sell CDs. When I, you know, when I can get them free, I'll give them free. You know what I'm saying? But it's a CD. I'm not selling for the gospel. It's the CD that has to be duplicated, and we have people that are on salary that it has to get paid, you know, to, to be there. I mean, I'd love to, to, you know, you show me, let me live in a house free, get all my electricity free, you know, if find volunteers that can live free. And wonderful. Christianity does not require money. Living does. Right. Traveling does. You understand? But Christianity has nothing to do with money per se, really. I mean, obviously there's giving and all that kind of stuff. But I'm saying there's not a fee. You know, and think about it. If I was going to charge you for this seminar, you couldn't afford it. Why? Because the information is too valuable. If I charged you what it's worth, you couldn't pay it. I mean, well, come on, think about it. What would it be worth to get information that can stop cancer? See, you couldn't pay that. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? But that's why it's free. God knows we couldn't afford it. So he gives it to us free. Amen? So that's why, that's why we do this. Now, it, you know, it, it requires money to go places, things like that. But honestly, that's why I don't make a big deal about money. You don't hear me talk about money much. You know, I, I hadn't, to be honest with you, I forget about it. You know, and that doesn't mean we got it piled up. Because we don't. But whatever we need, it's there when we do it. Right? Now, I've had people come along and say, you need to do this and you do that and it should be like this and, you know, but I am doing my best to keep this thing from becoming a business. You know, if I wanted to be a businessman, I could have kept teaching martial arts. I was a businessman. I made good money teaching martial arts. But I, that's not why I signed up. I, I, I found truth that, that saves lives. And so I, I understood that this is important to get out. So that's what we do. And so... You know, I don't want this to become a business. But even, you know, becoming a church, you got to get registered with the government, and all of a sudden, boom, it's a business. Automatically, it's just a business. I mean, so you have to, and, and thank God there's people that are, you know, administrators and things like that that handle that stuff, because I wouldn't, if I, if I had to do that, I would, you know, I'm not saying I would do something different, but I wouldn't do it the way they tell me to do it, <laughs> okay? I mean, I would, I've, I've said plenty of times before, I could just go back to going to, Walmart or you know a grocery store somewhere and just praying for people, but I'm doing better, more good this way. It's not about being a speaker or anything else. It's how many lives can you touch, you know? Because and you know I, I've preached in houses with ten people. When I went to New Zealand the first time, there were five people there. Five people went to New Zealand. They flew me from Texas to New Zealand, and we had this hall rented, 
and I don't, I don't, they did no advertising or anything. I mean, nothing. And we sat in this big empty hall with me, with five people sitting in front of me. <laughs> and I taught the DHT. Why? I said, why? Because that's why I'm there. And I did. And they went out and they did some stuff with it. And, but <clears throat> overall, you know, preferably, do you want to go fly around the world to talk to five people? No, you will, but that's not your best, you know? The more people you speak to, the more the odds are that somebody's going to do something with it. And so, obviously, you want to cast a bigger net, if you can, to get it out there more. Amen? Amen. So, that's why it's not about numbers. It's not about venues. It's not about speaking in stadiums and being able to throw out stuff and say, you know, I have, you know, stadiums filled with people. It's, that ain't it at all. I would rather, if, if everybody in here said, well, we're not going to do anything with this, and I'd say, okay, bye. I'm not going to waste my time. But if, and if five of you stayed and said, we are going to do this, then I would stay right here and teach the five. Amen? Jesus poured his whole life into 12 men. Right? Now, he would teach the crowds, but he poured himself into 12 men. So, <clears throat> you got to pour yourself. And even one of those didn't end up going the way. <laughs> you, know, you know, we don't even have a gospel. We only got four gospels. Right? And only Matthew and John was his disciples. Right? The other two wasn't even technically his disciples at that point. You know, Mark and Luke. I mean, think about that. What happened to the other ten? The other ten should have wrote Gospels, right? And then there's spurious Gospels out there that say they were written by the Apostles, but you can prove they weren't because they don't line up with Scripture as a whole. But, you know, e even though you pour yourself in, that's what Paul told Timothy. He said <clears throat> to, you know, give this to faithful men who will be faithful to teach others. Well, that's why I tell people all the time, take this material, go home, pull a group together, teach it, right? Now, unless you're going to teach it exactly the way it was taught to you, unless you're going to stay with the manual stuff and keep the message pure, then don't say it's JGLM or don't say it's our message, you understand? Because people come to you expecting to hear something and you're giving them something else. But if you're going to take it, take it and teach it. Teach it pure, keep it pure. You don't need to add anything to it. Keep it stripped down, keep it... The, the, the more stripped down you keep it, the faster you can transmit it, the easier it is for people to pick it up and run with it, and the less likely it is for you to get messed up, right? In any fighting technique, the more moves there are in the technique, the more the enemy has the opportunity to interrupt you, right? So the more likely it is that you won't get to complete the technique. Really, the best technique is, well, <clears throat> as I told you yesterday when I was doing martial arts, uh, I, I, trained, I trained under William Chung here was one in uh, Melbourne in Wing Chun Kung Fu, but I also certified as a full instructor under Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do uh, by training under three of his original students. And so I've always gone after the best. I went and studied under the best. I got certified under the best. That's just the way I've done things. That's why I went after John Lake. He was the best at what he did. And so <clears throat> one of the things that Bruce Lee used to say about fighting, they said, what's the best technique? He said, the best technique to win a fight is reach out and knock someone out. He said, just reach out and knock someone out. That's that simple, right? You say, well, okay, but, you know, no, that's it. It's not about, I know a thousand techniques. If you know one technique that'll work every time, you're better off knowing one technique. Well, I got one technique that'll work every time. It's called the name of Jesus. Amen. You understand? We, I mean, we can go into anointings, we can go into giftings, but come on, it all comes back to the name of Jesus. Why, why worry about all this other stuff whenever you've got one thing that you know will work every time? Everything that has a knee has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. So focus on the name of Jesus. Not on your name. Not on what you've done. Not on, well, do I have to fast? Do I have to pray? Do I have to? No, no, no. None of that. Name of Jesus. What he did. Right? It's in his name. Not your name. It's not your righteousness. It's his righteousness. Have faith in the name of Jesus. You had faith to get born again. Now have faith to get others free. Amen? It worked for you. It'll work for them. Amen? Well, yeah, but that was salvation. Well, what do you think healing is? Healing is just salvation of the body. That's all it is. You're just applying the power of God in a situation against a, a physical thing. Amen? All right, y'all you you getting this? Okay? I'm trying to make it as simple as I can for you, and I know you want details, because when you get details, you think you're learning something. <laughs> all right? So, <laughs> the, um, okay, let's see. Do you ever pray for anyone by proxy when the sick one is in another place? Yes. And how do you go about that? Same way. Uh, I will mention something to you a little bit later on where I asked Wilfred Wright about that and he gave me the answer at it actually. And when someone's in front of you, you speak, you command, you tell it what to do, that kind of thing. 
when they're at a distance, you do the same thing, but sometimes you will do it longer and harder and you'll get stirred up and you'll go after a little bit more, mainly because you can't see them. And it has nothing to do with distance, has nothing to do with be being weaker. It's just that you can't see them, so you don't know when you get it done, so you go for what we would call overkill, okay? In our case, it'd be over life, right? You just, more than you need, okay? Now, so, <clears throat> all right. Can you please touch on Job's affliction? Yes, it was sent from Satan. Is that enough? <laughs> okay, you need more, okay? It was not sent by God. It was sent by Satan. The entire book of Job, first off, the book of Job is generally considered to be the oldest book in the Old Testament. There is no record of Job having a covenant with God or having any type of guarantee from God for healing or anything else. We really don't know what connection God and Job had with God. Now, we know that Job considered God his redeemer because he said that at one point. But we don't know of any covenants or anything else. We don't know any details. And if we don't know anything anybody says is speculation, right? And so whatever, you could say one thing, I could say the opposite, and we'd both be just as right because we're both speculating. You understand? Now, what is true is that the entire time period of Job's affliction was about a nine-month period. It didn't last years. It didn't last his whole life. It lasts about nine months. And the thing to remember is that regardless of all the other stuff, number one, it said that Satan smote Job, right? So we know the problem came from Satan. <clears throat> and then we also know that at the end of the situation, it said, and God turned Job's captivity. So that means that everything that went on, God considered that, was that Job was in captivity to Satan. Right? So regardless of all the other stuff, that Job was in captivity to Satan, and we know that Satan brought the captivity, but we know that God turned his captivity and set him free. And when he turned his captivity, it said that God gave everything that Job had lost back to him and double. All right? So <clears throat> what you see is a bad devil and a good God. Simple as that. Now, <clears throat> people try to say, well, but, you know, one of the, I guess I'm just like Job because I'm saying, no, you're not. You can't be like Job. Job wasn't born again, didn't have the Spirit of God abiding in him, wasn't a new creation, had no covenant, nothing, right? So don't think you're like Job unless, of course, you're not born again, right? Then you may kind of be like Job, right? Probably not, though, because at least he knew something about God, right? He knew better. You have to read. At one point, God said, Job, and all these things, he said, all these people, they have spoken wrongly of me. All these people come, even his wife said, curse God and die, right? <clears throat> and she was the, end of, the one that ended up dying. So, you know, be careful what you say. And so when you read all this, it's pretty amazing because you have to realize that God told him, he said, all these, your comforters that are coming around you, they have all spoken wrongly of me. Everything they said was wrong. And then it said, but everything that Job said about God, he said, in this, Job did not sin. He never sinned. At one point, remember his wife said, curse God and and die, and, and, Job would, and Job said things like, you know, <clears throat> you know, God is given, he's taken away, blessed be the name, all that kind of stuff. He says some things, and God said, look, God understands you're human. He understands that in the middle of the battle, you're going to say some things sometimes that are not necessarily true. But he doesn't consider it sin. He understands. We're, he understands what we're made of. He understands that we're but flesh in many cases. But he said, in, in that, he didn't even hold that to Job's account that the things he said like that. So when people say, well, what about Job? And then people, everybody brings up Paul's thorn. You know? Okay, and well, I guess, I'm, I guess I got a thorn like Paul. Okay, if you're going to say that, Paul said that his thorn was because of his many revelations. He said because of his many revelations, he was given a messenger of Satan. Right? So we know that the thorn in his flesh was a messenger of Satan. It was not sent from God. People say, well, because of the revelations, he got it, so that was good. No, God gave him the revelations. The devil gave him the thorn. Why? He said, so that he would not be exalted above measure. That thorn, every bit of that thorn tried to keep him from being exalted, and try, which, ex see, God's not against you being exalted. He just don't want you exalting yourself. Right? He says, if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. He can't say that if he's against you being exalted. He's just against you exalting yourself. Right? Well, Paul wasn't exalting himself, but the devil was trying to keep him from, from his influence getting out and this message getting out. Right? Because what I'm preaching is what Paul taught. It's a new creation. 
It is that God is a good God. The devil's a bad devil. It's real simple. And so <clears throat> when he said that there was, because of his many revelations, there was given him this thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan, right? So if you think you're like Paul and you've got Paul's thorn, let's see some of your many revelations. <laughs> That's why he got them. So if you're going to have a, a thorn like Paul had, you've got to have some revelations. Amen? I mean, come on, Paul wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament. What have you written? <clears throat> right? I mean, come on, let's, let's look at it. Number two, people say, well, you know, Paul's sickness, you know, his thorn was a sickness. You can't find that in the Bible. Matter of fact, the, the law of first reference, which is a biblical principle of interpretation, says if you see a term, you have to go back and find when that term was first used and then find out what that term was referring to, and from then on, that term refers to that. Well, if you look up the term thorn in the flesh, you technically won't find exactly that, but you will find it, it says that there are thorns in their sides and pricks in their flesh. And you go back and reference that, and every time it mentions that, it is referring to humans. Every time. God said that the Canaanites, if you didn't kill them, he told the, the Israelites, he said, if you don't kill the Canaanites, they will be thorns in your sides from then on. Right? It was always people. Well, look at Paul's life. I'd say he had some problems with people. <laughs> right? He had some problems with people. He had, everywhere he went. And the funny thing is, the problems he had with people, <clears throat> now, now think about this. Who did Jesus have problems with? People. What kind of people? Religious, Religious people. The Pharisees. Who did Paul have problems with? Religious. Religious people. Right? And everywhere he went, it would, because he would preach the gospel of grace, he would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, it stirred up the religious Jews every time, and they would come after him, they tried to kill him, they stoned him, they beat him, I mean, you, you name it, they locked him up in prison, and then when Paul later on talks about his qualifications of an apostle, he says, I've been in shipwrecks, I've been hungry, I've been beaten, I've been whipped, I've been stoned, I've been all these things. And the funny thing is, in all that, he never once said, not to mention this stupid eye disease that everybody <laughs> thinks I have. He never mentioned being sick. Well, if those were persecutions, if those were things he suffered for the gospel's sake, and he got a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan, <clears throat> because of his many revelations, and that thorn in the flesh was a sickness, then that would have been what he suffered for the gospel's sake, then that should have been right there in the top of the list. But he never mentioned that. Why? Because he wasn't. You understand? You can't find one thing that says he was sick. Not one thing. Over and over. And people go in and try to use different words and say, well, see, it says because of the infirmity of the flesh. The infirmity of the flesh doesn't always mean sickness. It can mean frailty, weakness. It can mean exhaustion. Whenever he said, I left Trophimus sick at Miletum, he said he, said he had worked himself nearly to death. I mean, he had two or three different workers that literally he wore them out and they almost died of exhaustion and their infirmities was not sickness. He said, I left him sick. Look up the word sick. It is the word infirmity and it means weakness, frailty. It can mean ex physical exhaustion. It didn't mean they were sick, not with a sickness or disease. It, they, were, they were exhausted. You try traveling like Paul and his team did. See if you don't get tired. I mean, I was with Dr. Lester Summerall. The man was in his 70s when I knew him. And that man literally wore out every young man that was around him. I mean, he would take 21-year-old men with him on the, on the trip, and they would come home halfway through the trip just exhausted. And he kept going. Why? In his 70s. Why? Because he learned the secret of continuous energy. And, he, and when I was there, I, I kept seeing that, and I'd, I'd be there. We worked his prayer line. We worked. I was an usher at his church. I went there to go to Bible school, <clears throat> found out, he wasn't there that much, so I didn't bother going to Bible school because I didn't care to hear what the others had to say. And so I just found out what he did, and so I volunteered for his prayer line, and I found out he'd come in every morning at 4 o'clock to pray. So I volunteered for the late shift. <laughs> and whenever he came in, my wife would be working the prayer lines, and I would go in and sneak in and watch him pray. And he would come into the sanctuary. They had this big uh, map of the world. It had a light that shone right on it, dark, in the whole sanctuary. And we were off in one corner, and he would come in, and we had these pillars, you know. And so he'd come in, and he'd just start walking around. And that light shone on the floor at an angle and made a big circle. And he'd just get out there, and he'd start walking around. He was, he is, I've met some of the greatest men in the world as far as people think of great men. And I'm telling you, I've never met a man like Lester Summerall. That man is the greatest man I've ever known. 
Amen? I mean, by far, okay? And I've met some great people that I highly respect, but nobody even, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, you see some, okay, Bruce Lee was in a class of his own. Amen? In martial arts, right? I mean, there was no one like him. He was so far above everybody else that when you talk about martial artists, you don't even include him because if you do, you can't talk about anybody else. He was that good, all right? That's Dr. Summerall. There was nobody else in his class at all. I mean, it's just there are great men of God and then there's Lester Summerall. It's that simple. And so he would get in there and it's so funny. He would come in at four o'clock in the morning. He was always the first person there and he would come in and start walking around. He was immaculately dressed every time. I mean, I never saw him when he wasn't immaculately dressed. And he would come in and walk around in that circle of light and look up at that big map, and he'd just walk around. And he'd say, there's going to be revival in the Congo. It'll be this way and no other in Jesus' name. That rebellion out there in Burundi, that ceases now in Jesus' name. That man comes down. He's of the devil. He stops now. He's overthrown. He's out. A godly man will go in his place. He was, he was like playing chess with nations. I mean, it's, I'd never seen anything like it. And he was just walking around and just saying these things. And he wasn't, and he had talked to God. And he'd say, he would just ask God questions and then God would answer him and he'd talk back and forth. I was hiding behind a pillar watching him. <laughs> I'm serious, I'd, I'd hide over in the dark and just listen. To, you can learn a lot about a person if you listen to them pray when they don't know you're listening. You can find out a whole lot. And so he's just walking around. And so every morning I'd sneak up there and watch and listen to him pray. And he'd just pray and walk around for a bit. And he'd do it for about an hour, hour and a half sometimes. And then he'd go into his office and start writing books. And he'd usually put out a book a day. That's the way he would work. I mean, in the space of about two or three hours, he'd write a book and just put them out. When he died, he had 250 some odd books in the queue to be published. All right? And so he's just walking around. And one day I was, I was <laughs> after about a week of going up there and listening to him, he's walking around and He's praying, and finally I'm, I'm hiding over there listening to him, and he goes, well, are you going to come out here and pray, or are you going to hide over there in the shadows? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I, I just wanted to kind of sneak back. And down. <laughs> so I, I knew then, he knew I was there, so I had to come out, and so I come out. And, and you know when somebody's walking around and just praying, you don't want to get in their way. So you're really not focused on praying, you're just focused on staying out of their way, you know? <laughs> And so he'd go one way and turn, and I'd turn the other way. You know, so I, so I didn't want to run into him or anything. And then he'd walk around, and he'd, he'd get out there, and I'm praying, you know, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, but I'm trying to listen and pray. So I'm praying real quiet, Father, in Jesus' name. But I'm really listening. And he'd walk, and he'd stop me, and go, well, if you're going to pray, pray. And I'm like, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord God. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, and, and but the very first time I ever prophesied in church was at his church. And he... Um, it's funny because when you got a word there, you went up to the front, you sat on the front, you didn't just stand up and do it. And his sons were sitting over there and then they would say, well, what's going on? You say, well, I, I believe I have a word. And then he'd, they would say, okay, wait here. And because his belief was, if it was really from God, you had to give it, but you could also wait, right? Then you could hold it. And when the time, when he gave you the time, then you would do it. So he would go on a little bit and he would look over to see if anybody was there because it was a certain area you kind of went to sit. And then his son would, kind of notice, you know, nod about, yeah, there's somebody here. And he'd, he'd go on and he'd do his thing and whatever he's answering. And then finally he'd say, all right, our young brother here has a word from the Lord. Let's listen to him. And then so you, and it was the first time I've ever done it. So I want to walk up there. I mean, I'm, I'm shaking. <laughs> and I get up next to him and he hands me the microphone and I'm standing and right, I mean, I'm, I'm literally, I'm afraid to stand too close because I'm going through and I just, I remember I closed my eyes, opened my mouth and words just started coming out. And I'm prophesying stuff. And as soon as I finished, I'm like, and thus saith the Lord, amen. And I just stopped. And I look at him. And he, you had to stand there while they judged the prophecy. You didn't just sit down and go, oh, that was good. No, you, you, he, they had to judge it. He judged it. And he would sit there and, he'd, and I'd heard him say before, well, that was out of the flesh. <laughs> it's all right. It's out of the flesh, though. It's not of the Lord, so it's okay. So, I mean, that, so you knew. I mean, that, that really cut down on the people jumping up to speak a word, you know? So, so whenever I finished, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I'm waiting for the verdict, you know? And, and, but I was really kind of worried. I was afraid at some point he's just going to say, well, that was stupid, you know, just, <laughs> just hit you. So, but, but he just, he just, you know, went on. He goes, well, that was of the Lord. We need to heed it. Thank you, Lord. And I'm like, oh, thank you, God. Thank you. <laughs> So I went back and sat down, but I was shaking. <laughs> but I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, I would like to be half the man, half the man that Dr. Summerall was. And the guy looked at me and said, well, you're about half, his, about half the man now. <laughs> so, 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 
But <clears throat> he, was, he was just amazing in how he did things, and I learned a lot of wisdom from him and just how to apply things and that kind of stuff. Now,